delighted to introduce revolutionaries in revolutionaries the other story of how india won its freedom economist and historian sanjeev sanyal goes beyond the conventional stereotypes of india's non violent freedom movement to explore the radical parallel against struggle against the british raj looking deeply at generations that participated in this revolutionary struggle for freedom sanyal interviews a pardon me sanyal interviews a narrative of global drama espionage networks assassinations and intense heroism in conversation with tripur daman singh tripur daman and sanjeev sanjeev sanyal is currently a member of the economic advisory council to the prime minister he was the principal economic advisor to the finance minister for 5 years till february 2022 and co-chair of the g20s framework working group he is the author of several best selling books including land of seven rivers the ocean of churn india in the ages of ideas and indian renaissance His latest book is Revolutionaries. Tripur Daman Singh is a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Commonwealth St- Studies, University of London. He is the author of Imperial Sovereignty and Local Politics, Sixteen Stormy Days, and most recently, Nehru. We're delighted to have them with us today. please come on to the stage sanjeev sanyal and tripur duman singh ladies and gentlemen give them a big round of applause thank you for being here and tripur duman the stage is all yours thank you thank you very much should i tell them what the theme song was yeah but we didn't play it ah oh, okay oh you can ask them to play it. Would you like to play the theme song? Yes. Yeah. So why don't you listen to it and then we'll tell you. What do you want to do and then? Vande was 
those were the last two stanzas of Vande Matram, which are not commonly sung and are were not included in the national song. So I'm going to jump right in. The presentation starts with the other story of India's freedom struggle. And it's something that you write very, very clearly in the book, that the nonviolent part of the freedom struggle cannot really be understood without taking into account the story of the revolutionary struggle that you know ran parallel to it. For example, Jalen Walaba cannot really be understood without understanding Qadar uh, and without understanding the situation in, in Punjab. How do you see this relationship between the sort of non-violent Indian National Congress and the revolutionary strand of the freedom movement? So, um, thank you everybody for staying back on a cold uh, evening um, in uh, this evening. So, to your question, um, uh, what is what is the relationship between them? So first of all, I think the first point I make in the book is that it's not about trying to say that the uh, nonviolent movement did not matter. The point my book is making is that there was this armed resistance, which is also an important part of the story. And in fact, you cannot understand the nonviolent part of the story if you don't understand the violent part of the story. So just as the illustration you gave. Um, Jallian Wallabagh is presented as, you know, there was this protest against the Rallot Acts and uh, it was brutally put down uh, uh, in Jallian Wallabagh in the massacre. Now the question is, why was these Rallot Acts there at all? To understand why the Rallot Act was there, you have to understand that there had been an attempt by Raj Bihari Bose, Hardayal, Sachin Sanyal and, and the other Gadarites to cause a revolt in the, in the British Indian Army in the First World War. And this attempt, and there were several rounds of this, but this attempt actually failed. It came very close to almost succeeding, but then failed. And then these soldiers were all sent off to war in Europe. And in 1919, they were all coming back. So this is the context. The context is, there are all these soldiers who were sent out to war, who had come within an inch of revolting in 1915. And they're coming back home and the British are very scared that these guys are going to revolt and go, you know, and by the way, in, in, you know, in the war, they had lost the fear of killing Europeans. Yes. So there's this real fear that they'll come back and there will be this great revolt. So that is the context in which the Rowlett Acts are enacted. And of course, when these protests happen, they send in none other than General Dyer. Now, why this particular person? Why Reginald Dyer? Because he had been in the previous several years fighting the revolutionaries on the Persian border, particularly somebody called Pandurang Khankoji and his, and his revolutionary band. So he already had that history. So even thinking those things which are more mainstream known only makes sense when you know the logic of the armed revolt. No, so Kankoji, Kankoji is a very, very interesting figure, and he ends up in California, and after California, if I'm not mistaken, in Mexico. Yes. And that is just such a fascinating arc in someone's life, and that he, uh, you know, ends up in Mexico, and then when he comes back to India, actually, he is detained at immigration because he is still on the proscribed list. And, uh, this is 1948 got, or something. Yes. Like, yeah. And uh, would you like to uh, kind of run through uh, the arc of Kankoji's life? Because it's just such a fascinating story. So, Kank Pandurang Kankoji, just one example of when one of the many revolutionaries that have been almost forgotten. So, Pandurang Kankoji is born in Nagpur. And he's a part of various revolutionary groups in the first decade of the 1900s. And he goes off uh, to escape British intelligence, first to Japan and then to California. And in California, he gets military training, but he also gets a degree in uh, agricultural uh, science. Now, the First World War happens. The Germans are supporting all these different uh, rev Indian revolutionaries to take up arms. And so there are several of them in the book, but the particular one that Kankoji joins is a group in Persia uh, who are backed by the Germans and the Turks. And they're trying to invade India through Balochistan. Now, of course, there are many adventures ha that happen. And, of course, the Germans and the Turks lose. So here is Khan Koji, who is kind of 
doesn't know what to do with himself. He goes briefly to Russia, escapes to Russia, and then he eventually ends up in Mexico. And there he becomes a very famous agricultural scientist who invents many of the agricultural practices that we now know as the Green Revolution. And then he, much later in the 50s, does come back to India, and then, of course, the Green, he, he, he's one of the people who triggers the Green Revolution in India. Not many people know this person at all and this amazing contributions. Any one of these contributions would have been uh, uh, amazing in its own right. But this person is almost not even known in Nagpur. So I think him getting stopped at immigration and being grilled and being questioned uh, is, is a kind of quite a metaphoric moment. Uh, and it gives, it gives rise to this question as to why there has been a, a kind of ignorance of uh, the revolutionary part of the of the freedom struggle, and even in public memory, I mean the uh, the kind of later generations of revolutionaries are still alive in public memory. So you know Ashfaq and Bismil and the Kakori robbery and so but the previous generation, I mean Shamji Krishna yeah, Varma and and all of yeah. these people. Why why is so? There I think the early ignorance? generation is almost forgotten, but even the later ones, let's say Bhagat Singh or Chandrasekhar Azad you get the impression that they were these random acts of heroic resistance. But the fact that they were a part of an arc, a movement that was sustained over half a century with clear objectives, clear ideas, one of the objectives was causing an insurrection in the British Indian Army, and so on. So first of all, that entire arc is usually not presented. And I make the case in the book that this happens uh, because essentially in 1947, when India gets independence, none of the great leaders of the revolutionaries are still alive. Uh, Raj Bihari Bose is dead, Ashwak, Bismil, uh, Sachin Sanyal, all, Raj Bihari, uh, all these characters are dead. And the movement essentially, although it achieves its ends of giving India freedom, uh, it does not have any leadership. Also, the two provinces from which most of these uh, um, uh, revolutionaries came from, which is Punjab and Bengal, uh, they are faced with partition. So they are, you know, suddenly in chaos. Many of these people lose their homes. And so when India becomes independent, the revolutionaries actually do not play very much of a role in post-independence India's life. Uh, frag so fragments of this movement stay alive till today in the CPI on one end and in the RSS at the other end. But at least in the 50s, this is not a coherent movement. So what happens is the Nehruvians, having captured power, not surprisingly, perhaps, they kind of overemphasize their own role and they d diminish the role of other strands of the freedom struggle. Some of it rather deliberately, I have to say. Uh, and therefore, you don't hear very much about these characters. But there's a, there's, there's a very interesting point, as you, as you mentioned, about the contemporary strands of, uh, of the revolutionary struggle, which is so... Of course, India becomes independent none of the great leaders are alive. But as you mentioned, a lot of contemporary Indian politics can be traced back to the revolutionary movement and the various strands of the revolutionary movement. Uh, the RSS being one, the communist parties being the other. Would you like to kind of elaborate a bit on that? Because it's, I think, a, 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 it's, I think a, a very interesting strand. And we often assume that India becomes independent everyone goes back home and you know that that's it but clearly that's not it so that's right so <clears throat> the the revolutionaries the anushilan samiti which is what the umbrella organization under which they would call themselves that does not survive as a coherent organization past independence but there are these other streams of it that are still around so one of them of course is the communist party of india which was formed by former revolutionaries who were stranded after the First World War in Germany and other places. And of course, Germany had lost the war, so they couldn't any, no longer be protected. So they had to go somewhere. So they ended up in Russia asking, seeking uh, sort of some sort of asylum. And Lenin sent them off to Tashkent to be brainwashed into uh, Bolshevism. So in 1920, the CPI was set up in Tashkent. So that's one end of the street. And the, uh, and, and the other end, you have... Um, <clears throat> Hedgewar, who was incidentally the head of the Anushilan Samiti for Maharashtra, based out of Nagpur. Incidentally, by the way, his code name in the revolutionary network was Cocaine. <laughs> and he 
he is the one who then goes on and creates the RSS. Now you may ask, where did he get the idea of the RSS? Well, do remember, what was the Anushilan Samiti? The Anushilan Samiti was a network of Akharas. That's what the revolutionary movement was based on. And this network of Akharas was the vision of Sri Aurobindo, then known as Aurobindo Ghosh. Again, Sri Aurobindo is mostly remembered as a sort of a spiritual character, but in fact, he is the father figure of this movement. And Sri Aurobindo wrote this pamphlet called Bhavani Mandir, in which he describes the architecture of this, of this network of Akharas. Now, guess what the RSS is? It's a network of shakhas, of akharas. And we read the Bhavani Mandir even today, and you look at the architecture of the RSS, it's almost identical. And even the language they use, the words like Bhavani, Bharti, and these kinds of, the words that very commonly used in RSS's literature and so on, is derived directly from Sri Aurobindo's writing. So, I've talked about the two extremes, but there are plenty of other movements that there's, there's a, there's a party not much remembered today, but was once powerful, called the Revolutionary Socialist Party. Mm -hmm. This is again one, a derivative of uh, the oh. um, Anushilan Samiti. Uh, and there were many factions within the Congress that were a part of the Anushilan uh, Samiti. Uh, so much so... And I mean, you, you talk yeah. about the connections between the Swaraj Party, which was formed in 1923 by C.R. Das and uh, Motilal Nehru and others. Uh, and their own connections with uh, with the revolutionaries, and I was actually quite surprised to learn that there yeah, there are indications that C.R. Das himself may have funded a potential assassination attempt uh, on the viceroy. And so, did this relationship, uh, in a sense, this kind of revolving door between the revolutionary movement and the non-violent movement, was did this revolving door continue through the 19? 1920s and 1930s, or did it close at some point? So it continues at least till 1938. So there's, of course, the revolutionaries, by the way, uh, they were inside the Congress as well. It was a big tent. It was not just the Gandhians. There was a revolutionary wing with fairly uh, strong views. Yeah. And uh, this is even prior to Gandhi, by the way. We remember this as the extremists versus the, the moderates. moderates. Yes. But the way the Lal Bal Pal Trio and so on would have thought about it, or Sri Aurobindo himself, who was a part of that group, would have said nationalists versus loyalists. That's how they characterize the fiction. And of course, this then remains with the Swaraj party, and then of course comes to the fore with the friction between Netaji and the Gandhians uh, in the election, where in fact the revolutionaries win the election. Uh, Netaji actually won the election against the Gandhians. Yes. So the point I'm making is the revolutionaries were an important part of the Congress itself. The real breakdown happens actually with Netaji being pushed out, but even after that, into the uh, 1940s, you have Nalinaksha Sanyal, for example, mm -hmm. uh, as the uh, head of the Congress party in the Bengal Assembly, he is actually from the Jugantar group of Bhagajotin. So, the revolutionaries remain quite an important part right up to independence, but then a after independence, they kind of splinter out. It's interesting that you talk about language uh, and the use of uh, uh, use of iconography such as Bharti and you know Mother India, Vande Matram, of course. And uh, this brings me to a question about the role of religion and religious texts. Now, obviously, there is the looming presence of Hindu iconography and Hinduism itself. Uh, of the kind of Shakta traditions, uh, as you mentioned, and something that I often find very striking, uh, the presence of the Gita. As, uh, and the Gita is, uh, you know, we, uh, we often think of it as a kind of religious text, but it also has a lot of political overtones. Um, it's used for uh, when they swear their oaths, they do it on the Gita. You mentioned the Anushadan Samiti's oath. Uh, and you know there there are repeated mentions of people studying the Gita, reading the Gita. So, uh, a I, I want you to kind of talk a bit about uh, about the looming presence of Hinduism and how and why uh, you know the Gita takes on this kind of quite overt political role. So, you have to see f the the context from which these these revolutionaries are coming. So, the old traditional India, so to speak, their real big fight ends in 1857. Now, there'll be the sporadic resistance of Birsa Munda and the tribals or Manipur royal family and so on. But really, by the 1890s, it's all exhausted. But there is another response that is also happening. 
and that response is really coming from a cultural response to first to start with. It happens with Swami Vivekananda, it happens with the Arya Samaj, it happens with Tilak, reviving… Because as in a sense, this is also a response to… Missionaries. Uh, to missionaries and also to groups such as the Brahmo Samaj, who believe in almost a kind of uh, Protestant version of uh, version of Hinduism. Yes, so there is all these responses. I mean, Brahmo Samaj itself is a response to the missionaries. So there is this big modernizing effort that is going on and out of that, that is the context and as I said, Tilak himself is using the Ganpati uh, Puja as the way to mobilize the masses. So this is the context from which these revolutionaries are coming out. Mm -hmm. And so there are these very moving scenes in virtually every revolutionary group where they have these secret societies with oaths taking and the oath taking is almost always to some form of Shakti, whether it's Bhavani or Durga or Kali and they would typically do it with a sword or a revolver in one hand and uh, a, a religious text, very often the Gita in the hand. Now why the Gita? Well, the Gita is all about urging on Arjun to take up arms for the right cause, for Dharma. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so therefore, it has this very strong um, sort of message, now don't you know, be passive, get up and do something. So that is the context on one hand and of course, the imagery of Shakti is very important. I mean, the song Bande Matram that you just heard, the first two stanza stanzas that are in our national song are fairly secular. But the remaining part of the song is definitely uh, not just Hindu, but a very specifically Shakta uh, chant or song. And that imagery is a very important one to this whole idea of uh, Ma Bharati, uh, uh, India as a mother goddess and so on. So this is, a, this is very much a part of the imagery of the, of the revolutionaries. And, you know, the, today some, some historians tend to be a bit squeamish and try to secularize this. This is historically not accurate. Mm -hmm. Fact is, Sri Aurobindo himself incorporated his brother Bari in using exactly this kind of a initiation rite. Right. But of course, while they are drawing on, on, uh, on these kind of Indic traditions and the Gita is very much uh, a, a political text for them and there is uh, the looming presence of these Shakta traditions, they're also drawing on a variety of other influences and you talk about it quite a lot. Um, there are, uh, of course, Tokyo, Berlin, Par Paris, they Absolutely. you know feature quite prominently in the, in the story of the revolutionary struggle. They come up repeatedly uh, and um, of course, there is a lot of people, Savarkar in particular, taking inspiration from Mazzini. Italy, from Mazzini and from Garibaldi. Um, and how do all of these influences mix? And I know Ireland is, for example, a, a, huge, a, huge, a huge part of it. People are really uh, inspired, inspired by, by, by the, the struggle in Ireland, yeah. by the Easter Rising. Uh, so how do all of these influences mix? So these are, remember, people of their times. Yeah. <clears throat> And while they are inspired by ancient India, by Hinduism, by Chhatrapati Shivaji in particular, they're also being inspired by all these other global events uh, that are happening around them. So, uh, again, much forgotten, but Garibaldi and Mazzini were very inspiration characters for the revolutionaries. Uh, so was the Irish um, uh, sort of um, resistance to British, the, the Irish freedom struggle, the Irish revolutionary, so much so that um, in the 1920s, when the Anishalan Samiti sort of was reconstituted, uh, the name they gave it was the Hindustan Republican Association and underneath the, under, under it, the Hindustan Republican Army. Okay. Now, <clears throat> that is clearly inspired by the IRA. And similarly, they are inspired by other ideas like democracy and the idea of a republic of universal suffrage. So, when Sachin Sanyal writes the constitution of the HRA, mm -hmm. he talks about that India, after becoming free, first of all, they're demanding full freedom at a time the Congress is still demanding dominion, dominion status. status. But he also say, writes that it will be a democratic republic and that it will have universal suffrage at a time when uh, women in the UK still didn't have the full vote. So, they are all being influenced by all these other things, Pan-Asianism of the Japanese, for example. So, there are all these other influences that they are absolutely, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, working on them. And so, here's a question that I've, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've always had, which is that Punjab, Bengal and Maharashtra particularly become hotbeds of revolutionary activity. What, what creates the situation where it is these three states that take the lead. And of course, you mentioned that 
the outcome, which is that Punjab and Bengal end up partitioned. Is there a link? Well, it's very difficult to say why these specific uh, communities, uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's a long discussion, but all, in the end, it'll be largely speculative. Mm -hmm. But it's a historical fact that these three provinces were the bulk of the revolutionaries came from there. Bengal in particular provided a very disproportionate number, but Punjab as well, particularly the Sikhs and the Arya Samajis. And in Maharashtra, it came from uh, the Maharashtrian Brahmins in particular, but other communities as well. So. These three, these three places uh, uh, saw this real upsurge of revolutionary activities. Also, perhaps not entirely coincidental, these are the three communities that also suffered at independence. Um, the Bengalis and the Punjabis, of course, uh, suffered partition. In fact, many of the revolutionaries, having succeeded in the thing they fought so many years for, suddenly found themselves homeless. And, um, and, but this is also happens incidentally to the Maharashtrian Brahmins, which is even less talked about. Uh, you have massive riots in 1948 uh, in uh, Maharashtra, in which uh, the Brahmin community is targeted. Savarkar's brother, Narayan Savarkar, a great revolutionary in his own right, is stoned to death on the streets of Bombay. Yeah. And there is nobody has ever been convicted for it. No, that's completely true. And uh, there is, of course, there's a very, uh, I guess, again, a, a, I'd say a quite a metaphoric uh, incident that you talk about in the book, and that is on about the INA soldiers. Because, of course, we know that in India, they are never reintegrated into the army. Whereas you mention on how, uh, you, you mention how the opposite happens in Pakistan. So a lot of uh, demobilized INA soldiers return, they're welcomed, they are integrated into the Pakistani army, and then in 48, they find themselves at war with the Azad Hind that they've been fighting for. How does such a situation materialize? Why does such a situation materialize? So, of course, <clears throat> the INA uh, surrenders, the trials happen. Uh, while the trials are going on, there's another revolt, by the way, of the great naval revolt in 1946 in, in Mumbai, where 20,000 sailors basically go, uh, go on strike and so on. Uh, and these are the events that ultimately sort of spiral out and, and lead to Indian independence. However, the INA soldiers and the sailors of the Royal Indian Navy are never brought back into uh, the uh, Indian Armed Forces. In fact, the, many of them uh, die in abject poverty. They are not, for many decades, they are not even given any recognition as freedom uh, fighters. Uh, it's in fact just two years ago that finally INA soldiers were, you know, the few remaining ones were taken on the Republic Day Parade. Just last year, I think. So there is this almost deliberate undermining of this stream. But interestingly, Pakistan is actually ironically more kind to them. And many soldiers and generals of the INA end up in Pakistan, get incorporated into the Pakistan army. And they actually, when in the first Kashmir war, 1948, yeah. uh, you have key members of the INA actually participate in this. So the irony is the only time uh, soldiers and uh, officers of the Azad Hind Forge actually fight after independence is against Azad Hind. But that's how history turns out to be and, and, and in some ways it tells you also the, 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 what happens when an inspirational leadership like that of Nedachi suddenly disappears and you have this vacuum and all these factions kind of splinter into various uh, groups. Because that seems to happen quite often with the revolutionary movement. Uh, uh, leadership disappears, of course, because it's fraught sometimes. Uh, and again, this is something... Actively you, killed in many actively cases. Actively killed. And something you talk about is uh, how good the British intelligence gets at penetrating uh, these revolutionary networks and triangulating information from all sorts of sources. Um, and uh, the last generation of revolutionary leaders, you talk about Bhagat Singh, Azad, uh, etc., being, you know barely out of their teens, 19, 20, 21, when they take over leadership of the movement. Uh, but my question, I guess, is I'm, I'm kind of sidestepping that uh, a bit, and that is about where you place yourself in the narrative. And that's, uh, of course, anyone who reads the book will come across the surname Sanyal multi coming up multiple times. And in, in a sense, it feels almost like a personal journey because your um, 
of course, you are talking about the revolutionaries and the events, but then you also very much are traveling to those places. You describe their houses, you describe the places that events take place at, and, and uh, a lot of that narrative seems quite highly personal. And of course, uh, it is given, uh, you know, given your own family's, um, family's history. And would you kind of like to talk about that a bit? So, um, one of the things is that, uh, yes, there are many member, uh, many people mentioned in the book are related to me because both my father's and my mother's side of the family were revolutionaries. Uh, my great-grandfather, my, uh, many of my granduncles, etc. were members of this movement. So, not surprisingly, they are mentioned in the book. But it may be of some interest to you that although I knew, you know, I knew some of them, by the way, in my teens because many of them survived actually. Uh, the few do live, lived into the 1980s, so I knew them. But even though I knew these personal anecdotes here and there, even I didn't quite know the scale of this movement uh, and how it all fit together. So it was, it was only in the last few years as I researched this that many of these anecdotes actually made sense. Uh, so while, yes, there is, there is some impact of my own family relations, but I wouldn't say that I was able to write the story because of that. I was able to write the story because I researched it and, and I found all these bits and pieces. And those of you who have read my earlier books will also know, I actually go out of my way to go and re, uh, go to all the places that I write about. So I did the same thing in, in this particular case as well. So what you find here that I went to the cellular jail, I go to where Sri Aurobindo, uh, you know, uh, worked in Baroda as a vice principal of Baroda College. I go to where the uh, naval revolt happens in 1946. So, but you also go to places that are quite out of the way, as in where India House is in in uh, in London. Absolutely, and it's, uh, yes. it's an obscure residential street, uh, and it gives you, I guess, it, it gives you a great sense of uh, place while reading the book. Um, and I, I just wanted to ask what the experience was like going to these places and you know really feeling the history while you're also working with it as a as a historian. So it's it it it, it seems like a uh, a slightly unorthodox way of. So uh, I I am a great believer in doing this. By the way, if you read any of my books, you will see that I I visit all the places. The reason for that is very simple. Uh, you know. The old days, you just sat in some library and went through the archives. It doesn't need to be done anymore. A lot of the material is just digitized and available. If you know how to, what, what Google search you want to do on Google Scholar, you can find 80% of the material. Now, <clears throat> the point is, then what is my value add? Now, my value add is when I go there, I can tell why whatever is written there is written in the way I do. So you see, if you just read it, you know, so-and-so went there and turned left. Now, if you were just reading it, you would say, oh, he went there, he turned, maybe the turning didn't really matter and you'll just carry on. But if you have been there, you know that turning left mattered because if you turned right, something else would have happened. So, going to these places matters. And in fact, uh, when I went to Kakodi, where this uh, big uh, 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 robbery had happened, taken place, um, uh, the Indian Railways very kindly uh, organized for me to travel by a guard uh, uh, train, uh, a guard um, carriage uh, to Kakodi and to get off there and experience what it would have been like to do that journey. Uh, of course, uh, I didn't have to rob the uh, guard train this time. Well, that, is a, that is a very thrilling way of doing history and also a very thrilling way of writing. Uh, so I think it's time to open the floor to questions. Uh, does someone have a mic? Um, could we have the gentleman in the second row here to the to the right? Hindi में बोल सकते हैं ना? हाँ बोलिए बोलिए। जिस तरह से आपने मैं आपके सास की कदर करता हूँ छोटे सी उम्र में इतने अच्छे youngest author जिस जिस प्रकार से narration narrative गढ़ा गया कि 1498 में भारत को वास्को डिगमा ने खोजा जबकि चंद्रगुप्त मौर्य के समय 23 परसेंट जी थी और व्यापार ईरान और फारस तक होता था और काना भाई जो सेवन डेकर का जहाज लेकर वास्को डिगमा को बताया भाई ये भारत है ये ये कालीकट है यहाँ यहाँ से शुरू होता भारत तो जिस प्रकार से ये 
जो रचना रची गई या ये नरेशन नरेटिव घटा गया सत्तर साल में अब तक जो स्थिति रही जैसे आपने बहुत सर थोड़ा सा हाँ थोड़ा और भी लोग हैं थोड़ा संक्षेप में प्रश्न पूछ थोड़ा सा महत्वपूर्ण जो आपने दिया अनुशीलन समिति और फाउंडर ऑफ आरएसएस डॉक्टर हेडगेवार तो उसके बारे में जो पॉलिटिकल मतलब बहस होती है या किस तरह से होती है तो आज तक सर पूछने वाले बहुत हैं थोड़ा संक्षेप में आप प्रश्न पूछ लें और लोगों को भी पूछ तो मेरा ये प्रश्न है कि आपका सास इस प्रकार से कितना मतलब इतना मतलब इतनी कम उम्र में आपका सास कैसे हुआ इतनी बातें लिखने का देखिए जो लोग जिन जिनके बारे में मैं लिख रहा हूँ तो सिर्फ 21, 22, 23 साल के थे तब उनके साहस के बारे में आपके सोचना चाहिए मैं तो बहुत बुढ़ा आदमी हूँ उनके उनके तुलना में सो द पॉइंट इज कि देर इज एक्चुअली आई मीन टू मेनी मेनी डेकेड्स द प्रॉब्लम वॉज दैट द पोलिटिकल इकोनॉमी ऑफ दिस कंट्री सिंपली डिड नॉट अलाउ यू टू राइट इन अ पर्टिकुलर वे एंड एकेडीमिया इन पर्टिकुलर रियली डिस्करेज यू टू राइट नैरेटिव आउटसाइड ऑफ पर्टिकुलर स्ट्रेन आई थिंक द गुड न्यूज इज इट्स ओपन अप यू सी अ लॉट ऑफ डिफरेंट काइंड ऑफ व्यूज इन पब्लिशिंग नाउ एंड ऑफकोर्स यू नो एकेडीमिया डज नॉट हैव द काइंड ऑफ होल्ड ऑन द नैरेटिव रिड्यूज टू वंस हैव देर लॉट्स ऑफ स्कॉलर्स नाउ लाइक Vikram Sampath, etc., um, Sai Deepak, and others who are outside of academia who can challenge uh, with properly researched work uh, these narratives. So there has been a certain change in in things, and of course there are many channels of disseminating this information. That's true. Um, so you don't have to go to a particular bunch of media houses, etc. There's social media. There are events events like this across India now. They're quite commonplace literature festivals and so on. And there is a huge thirst. from the audience to know about what happened so i think there is a con- there's a ecosystem of things that have come together that are leading to a reevaluation by a confident india of its uh, history uh, the gentleman standing please sorry yeah. quick question uh, you mentioned diaspora regarding um, uzbekistan etc but i wonder if you could dwell on the gadar party and the diaspora connections with california the disbanded soldiers after world war 1 i mean i've spent some time with them in central california etc and it's still even today a strong movement so if you could dwell on that first. absolutely so the book has a lot about the gadar movement and they, this is uh, critical uh, incidentally so that you know this is basically a movement that takes shape just in the years just before the uh, first world war and continues through the period of the first world war and <clears throat> within india this is this network is run by raj bihari bose and sachindranath sanyal but in other parts of the world there are others so for example in north america this is run by a network of sikh gurudwaras uh, and there are many important characters in this like bhakna and others now <clears throat> this group um, then begins to organize itself in the in during the first world war to try and send both fighters and guns back to india to try and instigate this big revolt in the british indian army now the british know this so they begin to infiltrate these gurudwaras and in fact we know the british agent who did it his name is hopkirk so hopkirk begins to ins- infiltrate these canadian and uh, and american and also british uh, 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 british gurudwaras uh, and try and uh, kind of create a split between the nationalist sikhs Uh, and uh, and um, uh, and those who were more like who, who, who would become more loyalists and uh, and of course between the sikhs and the and the hindus as well and this is quite interesting because this causes a big split inside the sikh community uh, in uh, canada uh, and there is a shootout in a court room where hopker turns up to give a testimony and somebody called meva singh pulls out a revolver and shoots him dead of course meva singh is then overpowered and hanged for this so there are all of this uh, activity happening in this but what is interesting in th- that this has a long term impact as well so in case you wondered why on earth you know the khalistani movement has its uh, base in canada of all places on earth well blame it on hopkirk and the british intelligence efforts to infiltrate the gurudwaras in the first world war 
Um, could we, we can move to some yeah, could back. we have someone, uh, towards, could you take the mic towards, uh, towards the back, please? So sir. the gentleman in the last row. Hello. Uh, one question here. Okay. Yeah. So I have two questions. Uh, one question is that uh, uh, right now we see two, 2023, right? So first question is that how you relate the CPI and the uh, gold correlation? You need to speak louder with the mouth. Mic. Yeah. yeah. So one qu first question is that how do you relate the CPI and gold? The CPI and? Gold. Gold. Yeah, how is the correlation between that? Second I'm sorry that is uh, unrelated to the topic that we are discussing. I think this seems to be some economics type question. I don't think appropriate to a session on revolutionaries. Okay. Can I have somebody? Sir, sir, no, 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 hang on, hang sir, on. Sir, we? sir, I want to ask you that, but one question is there. When you talked about the revolutions, there is a violent action is a bit hidden there. Of course. Of course, like in the in the present contest is the when a persons uh, the groups they wants to revolutions. So what is the definition of the revolution in the in the present contest? What you think? There is another. so you you see um, the revolutionaries, and I think the uh, under here is the question that maybe you didn't articulate is how were they not terrorists, right? And by the way, the revolutionaries were very clear had used you know were aware of this issue and they would, uh, they would make their case. So do remember a few things. First of all, the revolutionaries were very clear that they were carrying out a long-term political project to liberate India. There is no example, for example, uh, of them targeting, for example, civilians on a systematic basis. I mean, tens of thousands of British kids studied in India at that time. There were women, children, all kinds of other people. You don't see the revolutionaries turn up and carry out something like the Beslan uh, massacre, massacre yes. and the school massacre or something like that. So yes, they did, uh, they, they did carry out armed insurrection against an occupying British uh, uh, regime, which was brutal. Um, but, you know, they were quite different from being a terrorist organization which is trying to spread terror for the sake of terror. And in fact, many of their pamphlets make this case very, very clearly, uh, repeatedly. And uh, also, uh, they were very clear that they were, uh, they had certain uh, uh, objectives. Mm -hmm. Those objectives were clear and that they would end there. So you don't see, for example, jihadi groups. Uh, say in a place like Kashmir, supposing for whatever reason they succeed in Kashmir, it's not like they're going to stop there. They will keep going on because they're trying to expand an imperialist ideology, which is not the case with the revolutionaries. Their objective was, we want India to be free, India became free and that was the end of it. Somebody Did at the we back. Have the question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, hi, sir. Uh, my question is, uh, like, we see that Dr. Ambedkar often asked that what will be the status of the marginalized groups if, uh, you know, India turns into uh, a, a, a freed land. So, uh, what my question exactly stands for is, what does this uh, revolutionary movement actually uh, stand for the marginalized groups, uh, namely the Dalits or the tribals or, okay, uh, yeah. you know. So one of the things about the revolutionary movement is that there are so many people from marginalized communities who are part of this movement. So the revolutionaries had very close links with a peasant movement called the Eka movement led by Madari Pasi. Uh, now much forgotten, but he was very close to the revolutionaries. Similarly, many of these tribal revolutionaries had uh, tribal uh, uh, rebels, revolutionaries were also a part of this revolutionary movement. So thanks to RRR, now people are aware of Aluri Sitarama Raju, um, but you know, Aluri Sitarama Raju was also a revolutionary. And you have Udham Singh, who yeah. today we would consider a Dalit Sikh. Yeah. Um, so many, many important characters in this book, you will find, come from these communities. And of course, uh, the revolutionaries themselves had very strong views about equality and so on. Uh, specifically, as I said, I talked about uh, at a time when uh, the, the mainstream movement was still talking about dominion status. They were still unclear about what would happen even if we did get freedom. They were talking about a democratic republic, they were talking about universal suffrage and so on. So please, in fact, go and read the constitution of the HRA and uh, it will be clear what their views were. Could we have a question from the back? Yes. Uh, 
Yes, yeah. it's a bit hard to see, please. We can't see anybody, so you'll just have to hand it to somebody. Hello? Yeah. So, yes. Mr. Sanyal, I think somebody just congratulated you for being so uh, brave to have written this. But uh, are you not pandering to the current narrative and writing something which suits the current uh, uh, regime or the narrative? Uh, that is being spread and I just wanted to ask you, have you uh, explored any Muslim freedom fighters and have you written uh, anything about them? S because uh, suddenly the freedom struggle seems to have moved from uh, British uh, focus to the Muslim invaders who also participated in getting us freedom. And um, so this is something which I think is perplexing a lot of us and uh, a lot of people would want to hear what you have to say yeah. about this. Thank you. So, uh, let me say that, uh, so what if it… If, first of all, um, the fact that the revolutionary movement was an extremely important uh, movement is a fact. And the fact, it is also a fact that it was deliberately suppressed for a good 60 years. And it was only recently that it, there is more conversation about it. Hopefully my book will add to that conversation. If the current regime uh, is supportive of it, so what? Uh, my purpose is to uh, bring out the truth about our freedom struggle. Now, as far as Muslims is concerned, yes, there are several Muslims in the book, by the way. Uh, in fact, one of my favorites is a character called Ashwakullah Khan. Uh, he was a, uh, one of the people in, who was hanged for the Kakodi case, uh, the train robbery I talked to you about. Um, he was the right-hand man, incidentally, of Ram Prasad Bismil. Now, one of the problems of extrapolating present debates on that, on that period is the following. Uh, Ram Prasad Bismil, by the way, was a, not only an Arya Samaji, he was a very important part of the Shuddhi movement, what we would today call the Gharvapsi movement. His right-hand man was Ashwakulla, who was a Muslim. So, <clears throat> the point is, there are Muslims in the, in the, in the revolutionary movement. There's also Barkatullah Khan, who was a part of the Kabul mission uh, in the First World War, al along with uh, uh, Mahindra Pratap, who set up a provisional government in Kabul in the First World War. Again, much forgotten, uh, ex uh, you know, uh, the Kabul mission is funded by the Germans and the Turks. So, Barkatullah, if I'm not mistaken, was a pan-Islamist. Uh, he was himself in, in a pan-Islamist. Yeah, so. By the way, the, the uh, Khankoji was fighting for, uh, with a whole bunch of people against the, Brit uh, against the British in Persia and many of his allies were pan-Islamists funded by the Turks. So, there is a, there is a ex multiplicity of, any of interesting alliances and combinations that you will see in the book. So, I think we'll have to call it a night at that point. Um, thank you very much, Sanjeev. Thank you very much, all of you, for attending. We'd like to thank Sanjeev Sanyal, uh, Tripur Dhawan Singh for this session and also the audience. Some of those questions were fantastic. Thank you for being here on a Sunday evening and helping make the Jaipur Literature Festival as successful. Uh, as a mark of our respect, uh, can I please invite my volunteers to come on stage and put uh, scarves around you, sir?